Welcome to Stand. This is where we help make courage contagious. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca. I ran the Alaska's Trump campaign this year, former candidate for U.S. Senate. And I'm joined today by my best friend and husband, Nikki Chewbacca. Welcome to the show, Nikki. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. Excited to have you. And we are at standshow.org. You can be one of our standouts by following us there and catching any of our famous episodes like with Bill O'Reilly or Ben Carson or Matt Whitaker, who is just appointed by President Trump to oversee NATO, right? He's the NATO ambassador. Our ambassador to NATO. Yeah, fantastic. So you can go catch all of those episodes. We are excited to have you become one of our standouts. Follow us on YouTube and social media. Today, we have an exciting guest with us. We've had quite an election up here in Alaska this year. It is exciting and it is also confusing. And so we want to talk about it because there are ramifications for what happens across the United States, including being one of the very valuable pickup seats in the U.S. Congress. But we are excited to have one of our newest members to the Alaska State Legislature, Rob Yunt, who is one of our standouts. Rob, thank you so much for being with us on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So you ran for the Alaska State Senate out in the Valley, Matsu Valley, Wasilla and Palmer area, for those who are unfamiliar with Alaska. We wanted to ask you, what inspired you to run against the incumbent who held that seat for a long time in the Alaska State Legislature, David Wilson? Yeah, <clears throat> um, it definitely nothing personal. I, I just believed that my positions and my policy beliefs were better suited for my community. Um, I, I think David's a great guy. It was never personal or anything like that. So um, I there are some things that are very important to me and to my community that have not been being discussed in Juneau in the last few years. And I knew that I could be, I could change the narrative down there, that this one seat would change the narrative. Uh, similar to... You know, I didn't grow up aspiring to do, to be in politics at all, right? I didn't know that I was going to run for assembly in 2020 until a few minutes before I signed up or become the deputy mayor or anything like that. But I um, I did not like the direction we were headed as a borough um, with local policies coming forward that would have changed our government format to match that of Anchorage's. And I don't think anybody mm. out here would agree with that, Um and so <clears throat> when I signed up for that, it was last minute. I had no intentions of running for this seat until um, it, it really, I, so I had a fundraiser last year and a gathering for my reelection on assembly. And I had brought one person there. Um, I'm friends with a lot of people in the legislature. I respect a lot of them. I think they're great, but I only invited one person who was elected in Juneau to come, right? And she means a lot to me. I grew up with her son. Um, I, I really admire her. Her name is Shelly Hughes. I think she's amazing. And so I invited Shelly because something that's important to me, I have four daughters, uh, an amazing wife. My ex-wife is one of my best friends, right? Like that's not common for a lot of people, but um, <clears throat> I've coached a couple thousand kids and, and I do not believe that boys should be intruding women's bathrooms in sports. Mm. And it's a, it's a strong belief system that I have and I am willing to fight for it. And so I invited Shelly to my fundraiser to give a couple hundred people an update on where she was at with trying to pass legislation to protect our daughters and wives. Right. And it never really dawned on me um, that it would be something that I was willing to go fight for. I hadn't thought about it. And one of the members in the crowd asked during questions, have you ever thought about running for a statewide seat? And I, I had not, and I had just gotten home from Pennsylvania. I was down there at a wrestling camp for a couple of weeks uh, with my son, my wife, my daughters, right? And so we have, our family comes from Pennsylvania. And so I went to a family reunion. There was a couple hundred uh, old Minnicks there in Coddles. And so the Minnicks and the Coddles have been in the Valley for a while, right? But they all came from Pennsylvania. And everybody that came up to me that day told me their biggest, their parents and grandparents' biggest regret in life was not following our side of the family to Alaska because there was no opportunity left in Pennsylvania. So here I am, I'm at this gathering for my assembly seat last year. Um, I had just gotten home from what turned out to be more than just a wrestling camp and a coaching opportunity for me and my family. <clears throat> it, it turned into a very um, moving experience for me. I've met a lot of my family from the East Coast that I never met before. And every one of them regret or not their regret but their parents and grandparents was that they didn't follow our family to Alaska. And so I came back and I was really, it, it hit me pretty deep. And I, I don't want to see my amazing state become California. Right. 
And we're at a time where you're seeing boys compete against girls athletically every day. I'm an ex-professional athlete. I know the difference between a boy and a girl. I have fought in front of millions of people in Las Vegas. There is a difference between my two sons and my four daughters. It's disgusting. And so I have Shelly at this thing. And then all of a sudden someone asked me, have you ever thought about running for a statewide seat? And I said, um, I just spoke from the heart. I didn't know he was going to ask me that. And I, I paused for a moment. I said, you know, if they can't figure out this issue, then I'm going to take somebody's job. Hmm. So how do you, how do you <clears throat> hope to do that now that you're in Juneau and you'll be in the minority with us? Uh, well, they call it a bipartisan caucus, but really it's a bunch of Republicans who vote 90% of the time or more with extreme liberals. I would call them squad liberals like Forrest Dunbar. What do you hope to do? I, um, I want to give everybody a blank slate and benefit of the doubt, right? Like, um, I, I'm going into it like common sense is something that should be passed 61 to zero, right? Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm not going to adjust my moral compass or my district's moral compass for anybody else. So I will pursue things that I believe to be common sense. And, and you know, on a national stage, you're starting to see, of course, they didn't do very well. Democrats did not do very well nationally. And I'm grateful for that because I don't think they have a game plan that works for our country right now. I hope that they'll come back to that. And, and we're starting to see it. And what I mean by that is old school FK Democrats, right? Our parents and grandparents' generations, they could balance a budget. They believed that you couldn't have a country without a border. They knew the difference between their sons and their daughters and so on and so forth. They were really good people. They voted blue mainly because their, their jobs told them to. Does that make sense? They've been pushed out of the party. Their voice has been taken away. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of really good Democrats in this country that don't have mm -hmm. a voice. Anymore. And guess what? They just voted for Trump, right? They voted for Trump because he's giving them a voice. And so <clears throat> now you've seen since the election, a lot of elected Democrats who are standing up and saying, we lost because of these radical woke agendas. And there are members of Congress, elected members of Congress, Democrats who are saying, we, we need to protect our daughters, right? So I'm going to treat everybody in Juneau with the utmost respect. Um, I don't ever attack anybody by name. I attack bad policy. I have no problem with that, but you'll never hear me mention someone else's name. I hope they give me the same respect. I am going to move legislation. I will run a bill to protect my daughters and their daughters and granddaughters and nieces and, and wives. So um, <clears throat> as far as who may or may not push back on that, I haven't put any thought into that because again, I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to, to help with common sense. And I want their voice. I want their opinion on that. I want everybody's opinion on this. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll see where it goes, but as far as the, the, you know, the long game for Alaska guys, I'm in the driver's seat. They're not, they just got rejected at a national level, big time. Right? Yeah. Let's follow up on that. So what's your take on, why did our state vote overwhelmingly largest majority ever for Trump? We flipped our house seat back to Republican with Nick Begich, which is a huge win for Congress. And then <clears throat> down ballot, though, we voted to flip Juno blue and in the House and in the Senate. What's your take on that? Why did that happen? I'll tell you exactly why. And I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but yeah. we have no message on education. Hmm. Conservatives have no message on education. I have a message. Right. I was three times I was put in this position to lower funding for education in the Matsu borough. I never did it once. I helped rather than lower funding, which I refused to do. I wanted to help make it more efficient and, and stretch farther. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> I have a bill that I'm going to run uh, that will empower teachers to help make more decisions in their classroom as well. Coming up that I don't want to go into too much detail on this right now, but um, <clears throat> that I think will make sure the money's spent better. Does that make sense? But my message on education has always been, we need to duplicate what they're doing in Florida and Mississippi. And if I lived outside of the Matsu borough in any other part of Alaska, I would be trying to duplicate what the Matsu borough has done with education because we are by far the shining star in Alaska. In fact, our test scores have risen so much in the last five years and the last three years specifically, we're now starting to lift the entire state of Alaska, right? And compared to other states nationally. And so, um, I, I think we can come together as Republicans and Democrats and solve this problem. I really believe that in my heart. Um, I don't think there's anybody down there from either side of the aisle who are ill-intentioned. Everybody wants to help our children. Everybody wants high test scores. 
how do we get there? Well, we're not going to get there doing status quo, what Alaska has been doing, because we've never tested well, right? We've made no improvements other than the Matsu Burl, right? So what can we do that would work? Well, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's go find somebody that's done well and duplicate their success, right? This is what we've been around for, you know, as a country for hundreds of years, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, find someone that did a good job and do what they did. That's Florida and Mississippi. And so I had a message the whole time. I don't think we as a party had a message. That's why we lost. Hmm. That's why we lost. So in some of these races in, in the house specifically, that were so close, good people that lost great people, phenomenal candidates. I never right. heard them talk about how to solve the education problem one time. So I think, um, I think what's going to come out of this will be good in the long run. <clears throat> um, I'm in my early forties, so I can play the long game, right? Like I'm, I do not intend to be a lifetime 40 year Senator. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am telling you is in 2031, we're going to adopt our next map and the Matsu Burrow is going to go from nine seats out of 60 to 11 or 12. And I can tell you right now, we are the common sense conservative area in the state. And when we become a much bigger piece of the pie for the legislature, the Matsu Burrow is going to take over state politics starting in November, 2032. And I think that's, that's I right. Think. Yeah, there's a there's an obvious shift happening across the country where we see the mass of Americans rejecting policies that have not been working and electing candidates who are going to do what's best for working Americans and for families across the country. And I think we're going to see that in Alaska as well. I appreciate what you said. The Kenai yeah. Peninsula Borough is a very conservative, common sense area, right? Yeah. Rob, That's let's pick up talking. on the other side of this break. Yeah. You're on stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We're talking with Rob Yunt. Stand by. We're going to pick up on the other side of this break. I know that Nikki's got questions for you, too. Stand by. We'll see you in a minute. Gene's Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram trucks. Providing the cars, trucks, and SUVs that keep us working. Keep us playing. Keep us moving forward. And for over 75 years, Gene's has been helping keep us connected. Gene's Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram the official dealership of Life in Alaska. Together, we are strong. In Fairbanks and online at jeanschrysler.com. At Holquist Homes, they believe in providing the highest level of quality at the lowest possible price. Over 40 years and 4,000 homes later, value and pride continue to be the core of their philosophy while building for Alaskan families. They currently have a variety of new developments in South Anchorage, Upper and Lower Hillside, and Eagle River. At Holquist Homes, they value the satisfaction of their buyers by building homes that their buyers are proud to own. Holquist Homes. You are back on stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We are talking to newly minted state senator Rob Yunt, uh, talking to him about his plans uh, as he gets ready to move into the Senate. I want to backtrack a little bit, though, and, and talk a little bit more about your race. It was uh, a trifecta upset in the Matsu Valley. Not only did you overturn uh, incumbent Dave Wilson, but school board member Jubilee Underwood took uh, the seat from David Eastman, who... Um, was another conservative uh, legislator. And Alexi Moore won Jesse Sumner's vacated seat against well-known Valley resident Craig Menard. So wondering just how did the three of you work together to accomplish that? Because I think that could be a perhaps a pattern and a strategy that others could consider the next go around to see if we can get better results. I don't know that my strategy is more than ones are going to want to duplicate, but I'll speak to my strategy <laughs> real quick and, and how it may have affected all three of us. And so um, I'm not a fan of ranked choice voting. I want to go back to the very best Republican versus the very best Democrat. I don't think you'd get anywhere in life. Uh, we did not put a man on the moon years ago with average ideas, right? I don't want average. I want the best of the best. So, but with that being said, we live in a ranked choice world. And so when there's only three people in these races or four or whatever, they're all going to the final round. Anybody that knows me well knows I do not miss coaching kids for anything. Well, I needed five weeks this summer to travel 
to Iowa in, in different states and to coach a bunch of kids from Alaska and get ready for national. So I'm not going to miss that for anything. I campaign aside, I don't care. I'm a coach. And so I want to help kids. So I left, I didn't put out any signs. I didn't do anything. I didn't knock doors. I was coaching children. And so I get home and we're right up against the 30 day report coming out. And I told my wife, I said, before I knock a door, before I put a sign out, I want to look at the 30 day reports. And it was clear to me when I seen my opponents, the incumbents, 30 day report where all the money was coming from special interests that I wasn't going to do anything before the primary. And I know that sounds crazy, um, <clears throat> but I, I told my wife, I said, I'm not going to do anything because I don't want to motivate these organizations to give him more money. I'm going to bomb the primary on purpose. And so for fun, I put out signs two days before the primary just for fun. So I could split test. I love analytics. I built two businesses from the ground up. I love to look at numbers. I put them out in one small area and it looked like I got my butt kicked in the primary when really I took first place in all four precincts where I had out signs. Right. And I only had them out for two days. So Wednesday morning I woke up and I put signs everywhere so that my opponent would not be able to tell what I did. Right. So that he wouldn't catch on to the fact that wow, that's what happened, right? And so where he where he had some signs, people realized most people didn't even know I was running. Honestly, I mean, I've born and raised here. My mom was born and raised here. My great grandpa, right? We're all here for a long time. And I've coached a couple thousand kids in this community. Most people didn't know I was running. So it was an odd strategy. I know that. And then I went to work after the primary with the intentions of getting, you know, 50 plus points in the first round. And so um, I would say that probably affected the girls as well. Um, you know, that probably, uh, we were all using the same political consultant and I was gone. I don't want to say I was being lazy. I was being strategic and helping kids. So it probably affected all of us a little bit. The bottom line is those girls outworked their opponents and as did I, and we didn't barely outwork our opponents. We significantly outworked them, mm. right? It wasn't even close. <clears throat> I made a lot of errors in my, if I had to do this over again, I could have done way better. I learned as I went in 2020. Like I said, I a little assembly race. <clears throat> um, I ran at the last minute. I didn't do anything right because I had no consultants to help me. In 2023, last year when I was running for your election on assembly, I didn't have an opponent. So this is my first campaign. This is the first time I did. It was Jubilee's first time too with a real campaign and it was Alexi's. And so we all made a lot of mistakes. We're all way better now than we were. Um, but it, it basically came down to hard work. It came down to hard work. And so I knocked, uh, between my wife and I and volunteers, I would say we hit close to, if not 10,000 doors and my wow. wife, I need to put this out there right now. My wife is the MVP of this. My wife hit 5,000 doors. Wow. Team. She personally hit 2000 doors and every door she hit in district 28. She talked about me and she talked about Alexi. And every door my wife hit in 27, she talked about me and she talked about Jubilee. And I have nothing against either of their opponents, any one of them. I like Steve Menard. I think he's a great guy. I think he's a great guy. Um, <clears throat> I like David Eastman. I have nothing against David. <clears throat> he ran years ago on a platform of term limits. And he's been there for eight years. And um, he's got a lot of great ideas, but he hadn't passed no legislation. So when you have a school board president standing there at your door, because she hit the doors. Jubilee hit the doors. You have the school board president who says, I took boys out of girls sports. I took boys out of women's locker rooms, which was happening in our local high school. One of them, right? We had an 18-year-old boy using the girls' bathroom, and right? So she fixed these problems in a matter of a couple of years. And, um, and she's running against someone that's been in Juno for eight years and had never passed a piece of legislation. He's a great guy. I'm not being negative. I'm just being honest. People want results. They don't want people to sit there and spin their wheels. So when you got Jubilee Underwood standing at your door showing you results, I mean, it was a, I, I can't believe she didn't win by 20 points. I think she didn't because she didn't start doing anything until after the primary. None of us did. We didn't do anything until after the primary. So what I'm hearing is a lot of, <laughs> uh, a lot of hard work. You had to out, outwork your opponents significantly, but you also all had each other's backs. You were, you were promoting each other basically uh, making it so that each of you was was knocking doors even when you weren't knocking doors you, you know yourself physically because you had one of the other candidates also sort of plug in your name as well and I think um, I love that kind of teamwork in a camp in sort of the campaign season it'll be great to see that kind of 
teamwork continue into and bleed into uh, the next legislative session in in Juneau, yeah. uh, which and is what you'll I get a, you'll get a kick out of this because I know you two are. I mean, look at your best friends. You're running a podcast together. It's so cool, right? I worked to District 28 mainly, and my wife worked District 27 mainly, right? It was just for whatever mm-hmm. reason, it's what worked best for our family. Um, it worked best for me coaching because we live over here in District 28. And so it was easier for me to still hit practices. And it was it was nothing against District 27. I love 27. In fact, that's where I grew up, right? But I currently live in 28. I coach over here. So it was best for our family. But my wife hit 27 and worked uh, that one the most. And I hit 28 and we did bigger numbers in 27. So my wife likes to remind me that you know, <laughs> she did a much better job than me. And and then, and so, yeah, she was out there working very hard and and my wife doesn't have anything against who Jubilee was uh, running against. She just wants results. It's important to her that we protect our daughters and we need a legislature that gets a, along. We need a legislature that can work together and do that. And my wife is very grateful for everything Jubilee did as our school board president. And so my wife went to bat. I stayed in District 28. Trinity went to District 27. And I mean, she's a workhorse, man. Mm. She's not like, she's an animal. Thank God for for spouses who are such great supporters and and, and work with us to achieve our, our dreams. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but 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 moving forward from the campaign season, we've only got a few minutes left in the segment. But I I want to ask you, and you've sort of touched on this a little bit. Uh, you know, you you already have clearly a good sense of what you want to do when you move uh, into that legislative session mm-hmm. in Juneau. I'd like to ask you about what some of your goals and priorities are. You've touched on uh, education and, and the whole bathroom issue, which is a big issue. And, you know, making sure that sports are divided along uh, gender lines. Uh, maybe talk a little bit more about some other uh, things that you want to yeah. do. And I'd like to ask you about that in the context of, you know, here in in Anchorage, you may have been following, you know, our our assembly doesn't seem to have recognize what's happened on the national level and even on a state level here about people wanting to see more common sense policies. And what we've just learned is they've passed legislation to uh, apply a tariff to a lot of goods now coming into uh, into Alaska. And of course, that cost is going to be passed on to the consumer. And it won't just be people in Anchorage. In Anchorage it'll be people across the state who are, who are taking on these goods. And so we've got that com- combined with a uh, ballot measure one that just got passed that's increasing the minimum wage um, and requiring uh, paid sick leave and those kinds of things. And so with all of that combined, we could see major inflation happening or cost of living increases here in Alaska, even as it's going down with this incoming administration. So um, as you talk about you know what your goals and priorities are going into the legislative session in June, I'd be curious to hear any thoughts you have on what you could do or advocate for as uh, our new state senator um, coming in to kind of combat some of the, the the nonsensical things that are happening on the local level uh, that we're seeing. Well, I'm really excited about those tariffs. I think they're going to be great for the budget of the Matsu borough because we're already getting calls for people that want to dock over here. So, <laughs> right tariff away because when <laughs> stocks start shipping or, or coming over here when we're buying a massive crane right now we're we're like the crane's already been ordered it's on the way uh we will be prepared um and so when we start doing much more revenue at the at the port which we did do it during mm-hmm. my four-year assembly i helped grow that immensely um well that's more money in our general fund and then we can lower our property taxes even more which we've done a lot since i was elected locally right so um, yeah, I don't think that hurts the Matsu borough in the short run. It might hurt us a tiny bit tomorrow, but in the long run, I will tell you that's going to help us immensely. So I hope they just keep doing what they're doing in there. It's great for us. Um, not so good for us though, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, uh, it, uh, there's still, there's still great places left to build out here. So it, uh, <laughs> we, you know, other things that I want to do, you I could go on about education all day and duplicating the success that we've had out here. Um, I'm very passionate about that. I want to help children statewide with with good opportunities to to get their hands dirty in high school because you, you got to talk about the three E's of education. And I talk about this all the time. But if you're not enlisted and you're not enrolled, then you need to be employable, right? So if a young man or young lady's not going into college or she's not going into the military, then what's that leave? The bulk of the children don't go to one of those two areas. A majority of them go into the real world 
and they need to be employable. So career and technical education has, uh, we, we more than doubled that in my four years out here. And I want to do that statewide and help these kids find something that they really enjoy in high school that they're passionate about. I don't care if that means being a hairstylist or doing makeup or nails, or if that means being a cook, it could be anything. You don't have to be an electrician, right? It could be anything, but let's let these, let's help these children touch those things in high school. So they're ready for the real world, right? So, so um, ed education, it sounds like is going to be a really big thing for you, which um, I think is fantastic. Um, hey, I want to pick up with you on this on the other side of the break because we, we okay. just ran into a hard, hard break. You're watching Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. Uh, looking forward to more of our conversation with Rob Yunt. Don't go away. Stand by. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We are talking with Rob Yunt, a newly minted state senator here in Alaska. Rob, you were just talking about what your priorities are going to be when you move into the legislative session in Juneau coming up. You talked about education and the three E's of education, uh, enlistment, uh, what do you say, employability, and what was the third? Enrollment. En enrollment. enrollment. Yeah, You're not so. going to be enrolled in college or enlisted in the military. They need to be employable. I like that. The three, three E's. So what else are some of the priorities you're thinking about? Um, our game, game management in Alaska. So I, um, I've probably done more hunting um, in my life than most in the legislature, other than Mike Kronk. Uh, Mike's definitely got me right now, but I'm going to catch him. Trust me. So I spent a lot of time in the woods. It's been really sad and hard for me to watch our sheep populations deteriorate during my lifetime. So we need to step up. The legislature needs to solve this problem. It's a bipartisan issue. Um, I think we'll work very well together. I got some great ideas on that and some good real world experience that, that I help bring to the table on that. Um, lands, the state controls 60% of the Matsu borough. The feds control 60% of the state. And so um, all of the boroughs are having an issue with affordable housing. And you got to remember the state of Alaska does not pay property taxes to local municipalities to help with education or roads. So I will absolutely run a bill asking the state of Alaska to give back 5% of every, um, 5% of the acreage in every borough municipality, things like that, give it to the local government, give it to the Matsu borough, the municipality of Anchorage, Kenai Peninsula, borough of Fairbanks, whatever. And then they can turn around and auction it off to the citizens which will bring down the cost of land and help house make housing more affordable. Timber, Bill Clinton shut us down on timber 1999. Uh, we've done 15 times more timber harvesting in the Matsu borough since I was elected out here than we had before. The state is ready for a match. I mean, we're there are so many areas. We've seen the big fire down on the peninsula a couple of years ago. That was, there was a gentleman down there, a timber harvest guy that had been begging the state to harvest that for years. And then boom, it all burned up. So sad, right? Now that we can self-grade lumber in Alaska, which most people don't know about, we can actually start creating our own products here and have them be legally allowable to go into homes so we can bring down the cost of housing with that. Plus, we can create jobs. Timber used to create 4,000 jobs a year in Alaska prior to Bill Clinton doing what he did in 1999. We're down to about 60 to 100 jobs. So there's an, and we didn't even used to be able to self-grade. So I think we can go past the 4,000 jobs we used to have. So there's a real opportunity there to help our budget and our economy and fight inflation. So I, I got a lot of stuff that we're going to be working on. Um, I'm very, 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 very organized. And I have a lot of bills that I'm already working on that are bipartisan, common sense, going to help every single one of us. Uh, you're never going to see me attacking anybody. You're never going to see me trying to run radical agendas. I am going to be running common sense stuff that will help everyday Alaskans. And so, yeah, I mean, that's everything I'm hearing right now is all really commonsensical stuff. And it should be bipartisan, should get bipartisan support, you, you know, you would think. So what I love about you, Rob, is being a person of strong conviction, knowing what you believe and sticking by it, but also just that, that approach of, I want to put forward things that should be uh, acceptable and agreeable to both sides because they're good for all all Alaskans. The, the only arguably controversial thing that I've heard you talk about that really, let's be honest, shouldn't be that controversial is uh, boys and boys sports, girls and girls sports, boys and boys bathrooms, girls and girls bathrooms. It's going to get way better because they're starting to eat their own. Look, I have friends from every walk of life. Um, one of my closest friends is a, is a gay man. 
right? I don't, I don't care. It's none of my business what somebody does in their wedding chapel, what somebody does in their bedroom. I don't care. None of my business. And I don't think the government should care, right? Um, <clears throat> but the agenda has gotten like so far left from just this crazy, minute, small group of people. And now you're starting to see them reject that because they're realizing this is radical and people are rejecting it. Girls have been voting in America for over 110 years. They've had Title IX for 52 years to give them their own sports. We can't take all it away. That's what Iran did. Iranian women were free in the 70s. Now they're not. That happened in 1979, right? Like that was not very long ago. We cannot let that happen here. We have to protect our wives and our daughters. And so Absolutely. And I don't think it's controversial. And, and I, because I have friends from every walk of life and family members from every walk of life, I don't think I'll be seen as being, um, you know, um, partisan on that. It's, it's not at all. I have four daughters and two sons and have coached a couple thousand kids and I know the difference and that's all it is. Right. I love every man, woman, and child on this planet. I don't care what color your skin is, how much money you got. I don't care about any of that. You know, what your uh, love preferences are. It means nothing to me. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to do things that protect all of us and help all of us economically. Um, that's, that's where I'm going to be focused. You know? Yeah. And you, you know, you're talking about respecting the dignity of, of everybody and, and, and the way that all of that has been framed is you can't respect somebody's dignity unless you accept, you know, that radical version of how, how gender, uh, gender should, gender should collapse in on itself. And, um, again, I come, it comes back to your common sense approach is like, we know what biology says. And so we're going to stick with that, but we can still respect and, and the dignity and uh, the sanctity of the lives of the people, uh, who suffer with gender dysphoria. It doesn't have to be a zero sum game. So I love it. Yeah. Rob, I'm really happy that you ran and that you're going to be in the Senate. You're going to be doing really good things. I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give for other Alaskans who are thinking, I'd really like to make a difference in the state too. They might be thinking or be inspired to potentially run for maybe a lower level office, like something in their community council or maybe yep. school board, or yep. maybe they just want to get involved and do something to make a difference. What advice would you give them? Call me, call you, like reach out. We'll help you. I don't, I mean that like my phone's on 24 uh, seven, reach out to your local Republican party. We are the party of common sense. We are the future. Um, we are not divisive. Uh, we love everybody. We're trying to help everybody. And so um, I want to get back to a time too, by the way, I I'm not anti-Democrat at all. I can't wait until the Democratic party goes back to the old school JFK disc. Because we have a lot of great, what I call JFK Democrats in this country, mm -hmm. old school, our parents Absolutely. and grandparents generation and some of the youngers. And I can't wait till someday the, the Democrat Party can say they're the party of the, the working class American again, because they're not. They haven't been in a long time. The the If they stop going so far left, they come back to the middle. It helps all of us. Right. And so. Um, but right now, I would say if you're interested in that, reach out to your local Republican Party or pick, call me 232-8340. Final answer, shoot me a text. I will help you. Like, I'm very passionate about this. In politics, the closer to home it is, the more it affects your life. Our school boards mean more than anything, in my opinion. They're, they're the ones helping our babies, right? To me, the school board is more important than anything we're doing, right? Um, local city councils, it means the world, local assemblies, it's a big deal. Right. And so, um, yeah, call me if you need help, shoot me a text message, um, reach out to your local Republican party. Um, I'll do anything I can to help you. So I think that's good. Another question I have for you, this was on the ballot here in Alaska, across the United States, in every jurisdiction where they tried to pass rank choice voting and these jungle primaries where anybody can run without being vetted. It failed except for in Washington, DC. And here in Alaska, they tried, we tried to overthrow ranked choice voting. All of the donations that came in were from Alaskans and they put in $14 million to keep yeah. ranked choice voting. And these crazy primaries, we had a violent felon from New York on our final ballot running for Congress. We had a actress from California, who posed as a pretend Alaskan running for U.S. Senate in the last election. And it looks like that initiative barely passed. We have 700,000 people registered to vote in Alaska, something like that. And the initiative passed by about 650 votes. So they're going to keep ranked choice voting in Alaska, even though it was 146 to one that the 
the ballot measure was outspent, right? 146 uh, yeah. to one outside money to keep ranked choice voting to the $1 Alaskans could put in. What's your take on all that? All right. So before I uh, like, I'm, I'm a very open and honest guy and yeah. I, I, I will speak positively about something if I like it. So there is one small thing I like about ranked choice and there's a whole bunch that I don't like. So I want people to understand. I don't, I'm not looking at this as like what's a political position. I'm looking at this as just my personal beliefs. I like that the governor and lieutenant governor get to choose each other. So the only thing about ranked choice I like is I'm in the team building business. You know that it's the athletic side of me. So they get to choose one another and run together and they don't get paired together later. Maybe not like each other. Beyond that, the rest of it's absolutely terrible. I worked with handicapped kids for three years in high school. I was an aide for, for Mr. Olette's program at Wasilla High School. Um, there are a lot of people amongst us that we don't know and don't realize when you're in the grocery store or, or driving down the road, but there are people in our society that have really severe learning disabilities and you may not even know it, mm-hmm. right? It's not any different than any of us. They just, uh, they have a hard time processing and, and, and stuff. And so this really is a really hard system for them to understand. The other thing is it's really hard on our elders. It's mm-hmm. very, I love my dad and my dad may watch this, but, and he'll get a chuckle out of this. If I have to text my father in his mid seventies, how to remember to vote. That's not a good thing. It's not fair. It's not right. Right. And so, and we'll be there soon. Right. So you're disenfranchising. When you take those two groups that I just talked about, you're disenfranchising 15 to 20% of Alaskans every day for the rest of time. It's terrible. Beyond that, it disgusts me that 14 plus million dollars from out of state left-leaning organizations was sent in here by the helicopter loads to trick us, right? They should be ashamed of themselves. The fact they didn't win by 20, 30 points after spending $14 million goes to show you it's a terrible system. The only reason they won by this is because they actually made it so confusing for some people. They were telling people, if you're a veteran, you're not going to be allowed to vote in the primary after this. Are you kidding me? Lies. It, it, it lies, right? Disgusting. You, you, you'll never be able to get an abortion if this passes. Like they brought abortion in. This has nothing to do with abortion. This has to do with, there are people out here that live amongst all of us who are darn good people who are not that young or maybe have learning disabilities. And this disenfranchises them and it always will. Ranked choice is not new. It's been around for a right. hundred years and tried in multiple other states. They all rejected it because it's terribly confusing for a lot of us, right? Not maybe not me or you, but it will be for us soon. We're going to get so old, you know, it happens, right? But it just, I'm disappointed. You seen me run my race. Did you ever see me attack my opponent? Never no. once. Did you ever see me make up a lie? Never once. Did you ever see me even mention their names? I had other opponents besides the incumbent. I would never do that, right? I'm not. And, and just the amount of lies that came out, but these are out of state organizations. They don't mm-hmm. care about me and you. They don't care about any person in the state. They're looking at Alaska as a cheap date to experiment and tweak new systems, work out the bugs before they bring them back to their state. That's all we are is a cheap date to the lower 48 radicals. We're going to run another ballot initiative, and I'm telling you, we're going to reverse it. We're going to win next time. Yeah, we so. got it because you know you said shame on the people doing this and also shame on the people here in Alaska mm-hmm. who were being complicit with them to – uh, pull the the veil over people's eyes with those kinds of lies. Just just yeah. wrong. I mean, if, and, if you're going to do it, make sure you're doing it honestly. Yeah. The other thing I don't like about the system is I don't want average people doing this. I don't. And that's what that's what ranked choice is really created to to bring forward is the average of this and the average of that. No, I want the best of the best. Right. Like it. Uh, it just it's not a good system. You know. Mm. So, <clears throat> so I do hope it goes away. I'm, and and it. You know, I'm sure there'll be lawsuits and who knows the whole deal, right? I mean, there's there's right. so few ballots separating that maybe some get thrown out. Maybe the maybe the no wins bigger, maybe it loses smaller, who knows? It's so close, it's 0.1% is the margin. Right. The difference right. is two, but the you know, it's 0.1 difference either way. And so who knows? There's gonna be lawsuits and stuff. But I just I'm disappointed that they lied. Tell the truth. It just you like gets... ranked choice. You like ranked choice because it helps get the left in there. Just tell the truth. Don't start making up lies about our veterans. Don't start trying to 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 deceive people. And that's what they did. That's what disappoints me. So. Yeah. We appreciate that, Rob. Thank you so much for being on our show. Where You're can welcome. people find out more about you as you move forward into the Senate? What's your website? Um, Robforalaska.com. 
robforalaska.com so we can keep up with rob and support him and his ongoing elections there we appreciate you rob thank you so much for taking a stand for alaska we'll be back right after this break make sure to stay tuned and we'll see you in just a minute thank you rob welcome back to stand you're with kelly and nikki chivaka nikki i want to talk to you a little bit about these alaska state elections that we just had in 2024, when you and I started this podcast, part of the inspiration for starting it was what happened in the 2022 election. And we were so surprised and a bit discouraged about how the nation really expected a red wave. And instead, there was a red trickle. We had thought that between the Biden inflation and the horror at the border, and we had gone from energy dominance to energy reliance on foreign adversaries, the war in Ukraine, that people would go, we really want to see our defense not decimated, but instead rebuilt. We want to see a stronger and secure border. We want to see jobs filled and returned. We want to see an end to the employment crisis across the country. We want to see a booming economy again instead of this radical inflation. We want to see families doing well. We want to see a stop to the progressive agenda madness. We want to see uh, healthy foreign policy. We want to see things returned back to normal again. We want to see families cared for, et cetera. And instead, we eked out a razor thin majority in Congress of people who would advocate for those kind of policies. We saw the lowest voter turnout ever in the history of Alaska. We lost uh, key seats across the country that we thought we would pick up in swing states. And of course, we we saw what it, what happened in the country playing out these last couple years as a result of the Senate having a majority in the Biden administration going virtually unchecked. And we thought, okay, what do we do, especially on the heels of our family laying it all out on the line and and losing, you know, just by about 19,000 votes that election when we had 19,000 super voter Republicans who didn't vote in Alaska. I thought it was just eight or 9,000. When you do all the ranked choice voting, if more people had shown up. Yeah, it was just a really surprising election turnout. When we'd heard across the state that so many people wanted to see change, that they um, said it's time for change and that their voices weren't being heard and then they just chose to opt out of their voices being heard. And so we said, well, what can we do? We really believe in not giving up. Uh, It's one of our mottos as Chewbacca's, Chewbacca's never quit. We also believe that Chewbacca's never lose because losing is a choice. You might not always win, but you can choose not to lose. And so we decided, well, what are we going to do? And part of what we wanted to do was really inspire people, not just in our state, but across the country, that you can make a difference. And I was really encouraged by what happened this election cycle, not only that Trump won by, I think, flabbergasting margins. You know, the entire country was surprised. Even CNN, when they flipped to that map, in which counties did Kamala overperform and the whole map was blank. And they lingered on it for like 30 seconds being surprised that she didn't perform overperform anywhere. Um, that we were able to flip our, our house seat by a huge percentage margin. Um, some of the seats that we were able to flip in Alaska were really encouraging. But I was encouraged by other seats that were flipped in even swing states across the country, like the Pennsylvania Senate seat, the Ohio Senate seat, for example, toppling incumbents that were really powerful. These are all really encouraging signs. But the thing that was really encouraging for me, and I wanted to kick this over to you because I know that you have great thoughts on this, is that it wasn't just Republicans or people who would identify as Republicans or people who lean to the right who came together in this election. And I think that that's really key because we've brought on people who identify as Democrats or don't identify as Republicans on this show, all saying the same thing. And those have been some of the interviews that you and I have enjoyed the most, some of the most thought-provoking interviews. It's people from across political spectrum or people who, um, who have different political ideologies all coming to the same conclusion 
in this political cycle to say this is actually the best way forward for America that created what we would call a red wave. But it's not because they're identifying with a political party. It's because they're identifying with what's best for America. And I wanted you to talk about that because I thought that was what was really encouraging in this particular cycle. I think that's what's so important. Yeah, in fact, you know, even the red wave uh, imagery, I, I think we've talked about this before, like I saw it very much as a red, white, and blue wave. It was, sure. Uh, to your point about the country coming together, we recognize as a country that we were losing what made us and makes us exceptional. Right. Not exceptional in the sense that other people are inferior, other nations are inferior, but exceptional in the sense that we are unique unique in the principles that undergird and that uh, are responsible for the flourishing that we've experienced as a country for almost 250 years now, Um, unique in the makeup of uh, our population that's so so diverse and that we're united around a common set, or at least have been for 250 years almost, a common set of core values and principles that make you an American. You're not an American because you're of a certain color or ethnicity, ethnicity, you're an American because you share a conviction and an mm. allegiance to and a loyalty to a certain uh, world view of about what it means to be human and what the nature of government is and should be and how it relates to uh, us as human beings and what mm-hmm. that interaction uh, should be. So it was very gratifying and exciting and encouraging to see our nation realized, you know what, we don't want to go down the road that uh, Kamala and Biden have been leading us and and the people on the far left and of the political spectrum, because that is not America. They actually want to destroy America uh, as we know it. And to see people across the political spectrum say, no, I am an American and I want to see America great again. I want to see us uh, not not poo-poo or denigrate our greatness, right. but embrace it as a good thing um, that we can do wonderful, wonderful things with going forward and into the future. So I was very encouraged by that. I was encouraged to see also the president-elect uh, recognize that red, white, and blue wave and right. start making cabinet picks and appointments that were consistent with that, you know, with you know, Tulsi Gabbard as the, you know, DNI right. nominee and RFK and, RFK and, and all right. of that. And at the local level here in, in Alaska, unfortunately, as you were talking about with Rob, we didn't see that, you know, that trickle down uh, in the same way, but we saw it at the federal level, you know, people electing, you know, the candidates at the federal level uh, as well across the political spectrum here at our state. So I'm really encouraged. Uh, I'm, a, I'm excited about what the future portends because I think we can we have the potential uh, to to see the country move forward in a really good direction if we can stick together and not let the the forces that are trying to divide us, you know, tear us asunder. Yeah, I think that's really good. I was just looking for a tweet that I saw Naomi Wolf had reposted from DC Drano, and I thought that he summarized it really well. He said, you know, in the last four years, they unconstitutionally mandated that people take the COVID shot and at the risk of, at the threat of losing their jobs. You had to, if you didn't take the COVID shot, then you lose your jobs or you lose your medical practice. They, because you would lose your license. They opened up the border and ushered in record levels of human trafficking and opioid trafficking. People have lost their relatives and loved ones to opioid abuse and to murders and homicide. They They've flipped our schools and flipped our hospitals and flipped our social services to give away free care to illegal immigrants at the expense of the taxpayers. And he just chronicled all of the abuses that have happened at the expense of, you know, they they withheld FEMA care in emergency situations, but sent all of our taxpayer dollars over to wars in foreign countries. They refused to help our allies in in other countries when it would require peace for our allies that you know now is imminent threat and dangers for us as we let terrorists into the United States. And what happened was so significant on election day because he said, we have got to remember this because this is exactly what America is built on. 